200 years ago. And the story of their marathon contest for supremacy is told in a new book, Titans, Fox vs Pitt, by my guest today, the historians Dick Leonard and Mark Garnett. Now, these two men were polar opposites. So, so Dick Leonard, let's start with a character sketch, if you like, uh, of Charles James Fox. What was he actually like? Well, it's very odd that he's known by both his first, uh, his four names, uh, unlike nearly every other historical character, and this was because of his ancestry through his mother. He was the great-great-grandson of Charles II uh, and the great-great-nephew of James II, uh, and the, he, he was named uh, after this. Uh, he didn't use it himself. He much preferred to be known as Charles, or very often uh, Charlie. He was, um, he was the son of an eminent Tory politician, uh, Henry Fox, who had made a vast fortune uh, holding the post of Paymaster General of the Forces, which meant the entire budget of the army and navy passed through his bank accounts and he uh, he could use the interest on it uh, to, to build up his own uh, his own fortune now um, Charles James Fox uh, was a very much a spoilt child his, his father absolutely adored him uh, there are stories about how um, he uh, uh, the, the young Charles took an immensely valuable uh, watch belonging to his father apart, and his father just uh, looked at it. Oh well, it, it, what, <laughs> it must be, must be. Uh, and you know, it, any uh, whim uh, which Charles had, his father uh, indulged it, and this had a very bad uh, influence uh, on on Charles. Uh, he could, because in, in later life, he was a great gambler, a great womanizer, yes. as well as being a great politician. Yes, I mean he. He, he, he gambled away his father's fortune to the extent of, in modern uh, terms, about £18 million. Uh, and uh, his, his, his elder brother was the same. Uh, he was introduced to the sins of, uh, or the pastimes of both gambling and, and sex when he was 14 years old by his father uh, and uh, in a trip to Paris. Uh, and he never had a, a proper... Uh, relationship until he was in his mid 30s. Sex for him was something one did with prostitutes or casual uh, acquaintances. And there's a considerable contrast with, with his great rival, of course, William Pitt the Younger. Mark, tell us, tell us about William Pitt because he was brought up really in an atmosphere of high seriousness by comparison. Well, he was indeed. I mean, right from the cradle, really, he was uh, destined to become. Uh, the, I guess the, the next phase of the Pitt dynasty after his great father, William Pitt, who later became the Earl of Chatham. And from an early age, while Charles James Fox was watching walls being blown up, William Pitt was holding forth in the classical style of oratory and learning the great speeches of the past. Uh, they're very different. I wouldn't say that they were entirely polar opposites, but the, different, the big difference is that Charles James Fox was very gregarious and uh, really loved the company of people of all kinds, of all walks of life, whereas William Pitt was far more reserved. But when he let his hair down, he could, I think, be... I'm a great champion of Pitt, and so I would probably uh, love to be in the company of both of them, but uh, Pitt, I think, would be a very serious but still occasionally quite flippant conversation. So he, he only let his guard down on, on rare occasions with people he felt very confident with and that's a big difference between them and it does I think explain part of the political rivalry that they were such very very different people and, and part of the, the, the thing about Pitt was he was his father's son and his father was a very great man his father had helped Britain win what was almost a global war with France and so it was a bit like me, I suppose, Winston Churchill's son in the 1950s. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, Chatham really could have said to his son, follow that. Um, and, and in many ways, uh, I think they're comparable in terms of their stature. They're both great uh, prime ministers. But the difference is that William Pitt the Younger was also a great peacetime minister. In fact, I think he was a far better peacetime minister than he was a war minister. The problem for Pitt was that from 1789 onwards, the clouds in Europe darkened and all the plans he had for a peacetime administration really had to be shelved and they consumed the rest of his rather short life. Now, if this was a duel, there's a third party in it, if you can have a third party in a duel, and that third party was King George III who the powers of the monarch were so much greater then uh, could dismiss governments almost at a whim and who made and broke both of them on occasion uh, over, over the ensuing decades. I mean, Dick, tell us a little bit about George III. 
Uh, well, George III grew up uh, absolutely hating his gra grandfather, George II, um, whose, whose heir uh, he was. His father had died young. Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, he, was, he was just waiting um, for uh, his grandfather to die so that he could completely overturn the system of government, which was the country was basically ruled by uh, a Whig oligarchy. And he was brought up to hate uh, the Whigs, and he, uh, he was told uh, by his mentor, uh, the, the Earl of Butte, uh, that he must uh, be a, a man, uh, a, a, a patriotic king, a man of the highest possible character, uh, only appoint men with high characters as ministers. Uh, so the first thing uh, that uh, George wanted to do when he became uh, king in 1760 was to kick out the government. And for the first 10 years, um, George went through six uh, prime ministers. He lost patience with all of them. Uh, eventually, after 10 years, he settled on Lord uh, North who was a great uh, power of his, just possibly was his illegitimate half-brother, but we, we, we won't go into that now. And, uh, and, of course, George III was, was very much known for being the monarch at the time of the American Revolution, and yeah. that became the great irritant that killed off the elder Pitt and began the process of bringing the younger Pitt into power. Yes, to a considerable extent, and I think that really the uh, it's very easy to dismiss George III as a, a loser who was on the wrong side of history and everything. I'm more sympathetic than Dick to George III because I think that he um, had a view of the Constitution and it was supposed to be a kind of a mixed constitution with the king with a definite role in this. Um, uh, and I think that gradually politicians like Fox and Pitt both wanted to edge the king, the monarchy, into a more ceremonial role. And George III really dug his feet in. There's no doubt he was pig-headed, stubborn. He had uh, a tin ear, really, for nuance. He just knew what he thought was right. But at the same time, I think that you can make a case for saying that George's view of the monarch's role was not out of line with the one which was set down at the time of the Glorious Revolution in 1688. And it was the politicians who were really trying to make it more into a parliamentary system rather than a constitutional uh, a monarchy with the, the monarch actually doing something useful rather than just parading around and observing ceremonies. And one of the reasons we know as much as we do about the attitudes and so forth of this, and it comes out very much in the book, is there's an awful lot of letters and diaries and written accounts floating around here. Just paint a picture for us of that, because there's an enormous amount of source material for you to play with. Uh, well, yes, there was. I mean, uh, Henry, Henry Fox has absolutely worshipped his son and was always writing letters off to his relatives saying how, how marvellous he, he was. So there, there is a... More is known about Charles Fox's childhood than any other uh, 18th century uh, po uh, politician. Uh, and most of these letters uh, were um, sa saved in an uh, archive uh, in Holland House, which was the, uh, uh, the family home uh, of the, the Fox family. The, uh, Fo Fox's father eventually became Lord uh, Holland. And they, they have survived. Uh, other people wrote letters which haven't survived. But when we look at the rivalry of the two, I mean, it would be great fun to trace all the twists and turns mm -hmm. of their respect careers, but I, I don't honestly think we have time within this programme, but the, the, the fact is that if you look at it as being a duel, surely Pitt the Younger won. Pitt the Younger was in office for most of his adult life, first as Chancellor of the Exchequer, then as Prime Minister. Charles Fox, Charles James Fox was out of office and brief periods as a minister and was never Prime Minister by title. <laughs> uh, so game, 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 game to Pitt or would you like to defend uh, Fox? Well, if we talk, talking about the kind of lasting legacy, uh, Charles James Fox is obviously associated more than anything now. Uh, obviously, his opposition to the American war at the time was the most important thing. But subsequently, parliamentary reform and basically liberal rights across the board of many kinds are associated with Fox. So you'd say he's the long-term winner, even though he didn't... Um, uh, hold office uh, uh, to anything like the extent that Pitt did. Uh, but the slave trade, the abolition of the slave trade is also 
associated with Fox. Now, Pitt was associated with both those causes, with reform of Parliament and with abolition of the slave trade. However, Fox is a far more romantic figure. I'm very happy to concede that, and so we can give the credit to him. But Pitt, I think, would be seen as overwhelmingly, from my point of view, the winner of their personal duel during their lifetimes. And you could say that, really, he has a legacy in the Conservative Party, I think for most of its early history, you could see that more as the Pitt Party than the Conservative Party because he was the great idol. So you would say, I would say, Pitt won during the lifetime. The legacy might be a different story. However, Pitt does himself have a legacy. Indeed, uh, the, the extraordinary thing about Pitt, though, all that time as Prime Minister, he did practically nothing else in his life except be Prime Minister. Well, he, he, he served for 19 years in, t in two terms. Uh, it was uh, entirely George III's doing because um, after the American War was over, uh, a Whig uh, government uh, was formed uh, in which um, the Duke, uh, Duke of Portland was the, uh, was the Prime Minister. But the key figure in the government was Fox, uh, who was Foreign uh, Secretary. And the King absolutely hated having uh, uh, this government and uh, plotted to get rid of it as soon as uh, it was created. Now, this government also included Edmund Burke, uh, and he was very, con very concerned about the corruption of the East, in uh, East India Company and, and produced a bill, uh, in fact, basically for the government to take over, put it in shorthand, uh, this, uh, this company. Uh, and uh, this passed the House of Commons uh, very uh, easily, uh, and it was assumed it would be nodded through by the lords. Uh, but the king, the king plotted uh, with, uh, particularly with um, Pitt's cousin, uh, Lord uh, T uh, Temple, and with Pitt in, uh, himself, to bring uh, the government down by t telling uh, members of the House of Lords uh, that the king would not only regard them as not his friend but his enemy if they didn't vote against this bill. Why be uh, someone uh, became the uh, enemy of the king? Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, they, uh, so they, they turned it uh, down and the king expected the government to resign. Uh, well, they did not. They went back to the House of Commons and passed motions deploring what the king uh, had done. Uh, and so the king sent round messengers uh, at midnight to take back their seals of office and installed the 24-year-old Pitt in power. And... Uh, Fox never, was never in office again for another 23 years until in the last months of his life he became Foreign Secretary uh, for the third time. So the um, King had had a decisive effect on both careers, pushing uh, Pitt up and pushing Fox down. <laughs> this is a strange roller coaster to run. But just a final thought, really. Are there modern parallels? That, can you see a Pitt or a Fox in today's politics. I mean, there are people out there who would say that, that Boris Johnson has a, has a bit of Charles James Fox about him, an orator, a charismatic character, whatever. I would think the closest parallel to Fox in modern times is Nye Bevan, who was a very attractive uh, person, absolutely adored by his followers and hated uh, by his opponents, who, uh, who had great achievements but had very poor political judgment, sort of uh, resigned uh, uh, twice, uh, and uh, ha had very... He has a greater historical uh, achievements uh, than Fox, uh, largely the, uh, the National Health Service, whereas Fox uh, you know, it was key uh, to the abolition of the slave trade. He improved the libel laws, but apart from that, had no legislative uh, 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 Mark, achievements uh, uh, at all. Um, uh, Mark, a parallel to Pitt, is there a politician out there at the moment in the 21st century who reminds you? I, well, I think the main thing, apart from his administrative efficiency, which is a great hallmark of Pitt, he was also a great parliamentary orator, and uh, I think that that art really is no longer as important. So the parallels are very difficult to find in the contemporary world. Uh, but I think that the closest person to Pitt of recent-ish times was Edward Heath, uh, because Edward Heath similarly uh, was a details man in many respects. And um, uh, at the same time, somebody with a, a rather shy uh, character. So in terms of, as a person, I think Pitt and Heath are similar. And I think that probably they would have found themselves in the same, what I would call, liberal conservative tradition. 
Uh, and so if, uh, I think that beyond that, it's very difficult. We don't see the likes of Pitt or indeed I would suggest Fox anymore. Well, some intriguing parallels and some intriguing lessons even a couple of centuries later. Dick Leonard, Mark Garnett, thanks very much for joining us. Titans, Fox vs Pitt is published by IB Taurus.